Welcome to Data Brew by Databricks with Denny and Brooke. The series allows us to explore various topics in the data and AI community. And whether we're talking about data engineering or data science, we're going to interview subject matter experts to dive deeper into these topics. <clears throat> this season, we'll be focusing on large language models, or LLMs, while we're enjoying our morning brew. My name is Denny Lee. I'm a developer advocate at Databricks and one half of Databricks. Hello everyone, my name is Brooke Wenig. I lead our machine learning practice at Databricks and the other half of Databrew. And today I am thrilled to introduce some of our instructors from the latest large language models application through production course. We have Joseph Bradley, a lead product specialist in machine learning, Sam Raymond, a senior data scientist, and Cheng Yunen, a senior data scientist. And before we dive into intros for everyone, I uh, would love to just go around the table and just talk about how you got into the field of uh, machine learning. How about let's start with you, Joseph. Uh, sure. So as an undergrad, I was studying computer science and I read a book about Sugarscape, which was like a agent based social simulation. Got like really excited, went to a professor, said like, I want to do agent based modeling. He was like, I well, you know what agents are, I you know what modeling is, but I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Why don't you take my AI course and then come talk with me? And so I did that and got into machine learning, started doing research. It was very cool. Uh, how about you go next, Sam? Sure. So I, my background really was in mechanical engineering, physics, that kind of thing. And towards the end of my PhD, we started to see AI being put into everything. Well, really back then it was deep learning was the, the buzzword. And so I wanted to sort of think, could we teach a neural network the laws of physics? You know, could it sort of know what's going to happen in the future by just telling it what's happening today? And I told my advisor that he thought I was a bit crazy. Uh, but I went away and uh, tried to find out as much as I could. And we ended up building a system that predicted how to grow an organ on a chip using deep learning and some of the simulation stuff that we'd worked on. And since then, uh, I was pretty much wrapped up in AI and ML for the rest of it. Who and as for me, I got started in ML through... Uh... Basically, in my senior year for my for my thesis, I was studying ecology and statistics at that time, and I was trying to understand the distribution and growth of maple trees. Uh, so my thesis advisor asked me to use Monte Carlo to do that uh, modeling. So that's how I started in machine learning. Awesome, awesome. And so for this podcast, we're going to dive straight into LLMs. Um, since you all are experts in the field, instructors of a super popular course, um, how about we kick it off with prompt engineering? Like that's a super hot topic right now, but if you could help dispel it for all of our listeners, what is prompt engineering and perhaps some best practices that you've seen with prompt engineering? All right, so I'd say prompt engineering is basically crafting the otherwise natural, you know, completely open text, which you would send to an LLM as a query into something a bit more structured, a bit clearer, basically just like you would tell a human being very explicit instructions if you wanted to be clear about what you wanted from them. Like you do the same thing with an LLM. And any best practices for working with prompts? Uh, sure, I'll mention a couple. Um, I think the, I mean, the first thing in terms of being clear is having clear instructions. And that can sometimes mean like having a keyword, like translate blank to blank, or it can mean uh, explaining multiple times, like having instruction at the beginning, closing off again at the end. Um, and of course, it, it ends up being very application data model dependent. So hence the engineering do end up needing to tweak and adjust and test. Uh, maybe Sam and Chung Yan. Yeah, I, I think one thing that's really interesting about large language models, as opposed to other deep learning technology, is just how familiar it seems to people. And, and I think that's one of the reasons LLMs sort of breached into the public eye a lot more than other technologies this early was that you can speak to them naturally. And that's because of the training data, right? Their, their focus is to try and predict for, for generative models, the focus is to try and predict the next token. So that's like a word or a piece of a word. And the way that data sets of these models are typically curated is by looking at conversations or by looking at passages of text that have a flow. And so when you, when you prompt a large language model, what you're really doing is trying to get it into the format that it 
knows how to then add the next letter or the next word or whatever. And I think with prompt engineering, the reason that it's not just one way to do it is that models are trained in very different ways. They're trained on different data sets. And so different ways of speaking to an LLM are needed because they're built with you know different needs in mind. So some are like just said, they're translational, some are more just uh, directly producing the next piece of text uh, and so on. And so I think one thing that's tricky and, and I know we've had that the, you've had some previous guests on like security uh, prompt engineering is certainly something that's going to become very important for security aspects. Uh, and I think uh, actually I know Chingin has some experience here, so I'll maybe pass that on to her, but uh, prompt hacking and, and these sorts of things are a real problem these days. Yeah, the other thing that I will add is that a lot of people think that prompt engineering can be a magic bullet to suddenly make a large language models work well. But remember that prompt engineering is still very much an iterative exercise, just like we would develop any machine learning models in different steps or different cycles. We start from a basic one and then advance to a more advanced prompt. So the same type of process will also uh, be applied to prompt engineering as well. And we also would need to take this test the same prompt against or across many different samples, you know, rather than seeing that, oh, this one prompt works well against this one sample and therefore we can apply to all the samples. So we, we will need to be able to make sure that the prompt can generalize well across the different texts that we're, we're uh, supplying to the large language model. Well, this is really cool. So, okay, one of the things that I'm probably going to direct at you, Changing, for first on this one, is that when we talk about LMs and generative AI in general, the the context is that now what's the new hotness per se is is also to talk about vector databases, which is like, hey, I'm out. I, I need a vector database so I can do all of the you know feature engineering, prompt engineering, whatever else that they need to go do. So, I, I guess the first question I'm going to ask, and then again, well, I'm going to start with you. This is for everybody as well. Number one, what's a vector database? And number two, is it even necessary? And you know. Yeah, I'm not trying to segue or lead lead the question, so my apologies. So yes, <laughs> let's let's start with that. Actually, yeah. No, oh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, vector databases are definitely on everybody's thumbs today. So we're talking about how do we integrate vector databases in almost every LM application. But we need to first understand that vector databases are essentially just regular relational databases with semantic similarity search uh, functionality built in. So it means that a lot of the relational databases do can support this type of search capability. You know, we think about uh, Postgres, for example, they have their own search plugin. We can also even implement our search algorithm and then supplement that on top of our relational databases as well. So really the functionality of vector databases is able to provide us that semantic search capability. So when we start from there, then it's easy to see what kind of NLP applications or LM applications do not need in your semantic search. You know, we typically think about translation, summarization. These are use cases that where you don't actually need to search for any semantic similarity, you know, like relevant documents. You don't really need to supply your LLMs with additional knowledge or additional context. So it means that we, we need to start from the use case first, thinking about what kind of use cases do we actually need to supply our LMs with uh, additional context? And then we can go from there, you know, whether we need a vector database or not. Cool, that's really helpful. Uh, anybody else want to chime in actually on what their thought processes around vector databases? But thank you, Chang, that really, really was helpful. Well, I actually have a question for Chang, because uh, you know, I've been in discussions with some of the customers and just other people and there's a, there seems to be a lot of confusion around, do I need this type of database? Do I need that type of, just in the scope of vector databases. And there's a lot of ambiguity between vector databases, vector libraries, what all these different things are. Uh, do you think that we're going to consolidate around some players or do you think like the, the big ones haven't really come out yet? Like where, where do you think that's going? Sam is asking me a in investor type of question. <laughs> But I think we can start maybe from thinking about vector databases as like in terms of a variety of applications or maybe the solution providers that we see. You know, something that has been around for a long time is called Face, you know, Facebook AI Similarity Search. I believe uh, the, the paper was published in 2019 and Facebook has been using it ever since. Uh, so it is a vector library that does vector indexing uh, 
be, be under the hood. So vector indexing here just means that we are essentially trying to create sort of like a table of content or a data structure that can help users to find the documents well. You know, so when we think about that kind of vector search, you know, in that context, then it really means that whether, whether we have a vector library, whether we have a vector database, or whether we just have a search plugin on a relational database, all that comes down to whether or not, you know, the solution can support vector search well enough. And when I say well enough, it probably would depend on how fast your data is being updated and how low of a latency do you expect your latency, you know, serving rate to be. So all of those tangential serving requirements are going to be the ones that determine what, what kind of vector solutions that you actually need. Other than that, vector databases or vector plugins or vector, vector libraries are really just tools that supply you with vector search capability. Right, and, and I think also, uh, and Joseph, maybe I'll let you talk more about this, but the reason we have vector databases and the reason that they're useful in the concept of large language models is really just skips a step for us, right? It makes it easier to interact with them. And I know Joseph, for your part in the course, that you, uh, that you, the first part that you start with, you talk about LLM applications. Uh, what, what would, what do you think are like the most useful applications with vector databases and LLMs? For sure. I mean, I guess I like, vec like speaking about vector databases, plug in with the LLMs because I think it kind of highlights the, like what a human would do. You know, if you want to find something out, you search the web, you find a bunch of relevant documents, you read and understand them and you write out an answer to whatever you were looking for originally. And LLMs, I think, are you know, solving that part, which previously only humans could do, of aggregating that information. Um, and so I think you, know, you can think of a vector database like a, a web search, essentially, except maybe it won't be the web. It'll be your proprietary set of corporate documents or whatever. Um, and I think that that kind of speaks to the sorts of applications where, you know, typically companies or research labs or whatever have a lot of valuable documents with information. Um, I think law is one particular one where there are a ridiculous number of long documents that need to be parsed through and understood, uh, but where um, LLMs offer a lot of potential. That said, I, I do think it also, there is a conflict there among some people working at LLMs where some picture sort of creating massive LLMs, which store, you know, all the data in the world. Whereas with a vector database, the idea is the LLM just needs to understand things. It doesn't need to like know things. And a vector database lets you augment that, that understanding with actual knowledge. Um, so I think like that gives people some more confidence, especially if uh, LLMs can then go back and cite sources. Um, and so, like in terms of applications, you know, that leaves a, a ton of possibilities, you know, help me prepare this law brief, but provide actual citations to sources. So I know you're not hallucinating or, you know, what's this answer to this, like, you know, what genes are related to this other gene, but provide sources so I can go back and see the details because I'm an expert, that kind of thing. I, actually, that's a really good segue. So for maybe the folks who are here, they might not know what we mean by hallucination. So when we start talking about that, this is a definite problem when it comes to working with LLMs. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yes. Hallucination typically refers to when we generate text that is syntactically or even semantically plausible, but it's entirely not factual. Uh, so that, that is hallucination. And if we think about like in a traditional field of linguistics, uh, so, so someone, I, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he famously gave this example of the sentence of uh, colorless ideas uh, sleep furiously. So this sounds like a perfectly grammatically correct and plausible sentence, but it actually is not meaningful. What does it mean by colorless and green ideas like sleeping furiously? So that is the type of examples that we see in LMs today. Uh, even when we can read about completely natural, natural and confident response, generated by, by an LLM, but when we read about it or think about it a bit further, we realize that it's actually not logical at all, and it cannot be verified uh, in terms of its uh, factual value. And can you talk a little bit more about intrinsic and extrinsic hallucinations and some of the differences between the two? 
Yeah, so intrinsic and uh, so generally there are two different types of hallucination. One is when you can verify the output from the source and the other is when you cannot actually verify the output. So for example, with intrinsic hallucination is when I give uh, an LIM a fact, you know, maybe things like when was the Ebola vaccine first approved or where was the World Cup last held and it gave me a factually incorrect answer. But with extrinsic hallucination, it means that the output, even though it sounds possible, we can't actually verify it. You know, for example, I, I may say that I went to Portland yesterday and I had an, um, at, and I tried out tacos, you know, and other amazing items. But when I asked LMS to generate me more output, maybe it would add details like, oh, I went to this particular street or I went to visit this particular vendor information that haven't yet supplied to the LLM. So the additional output is uh, that we cannot verify from the source is what we typically refer to as extrinsic hallucination. Yeah, I, just a funny story. I was doing a, a meetup recently and I was actually doing a comparison between different LLMs and I was asking the question, which, uh, which bagels are better, Montreal versus New York? And but what was really funny is the alpaca LM actually responded that Don Levy, the chef and proprietor of San Vieter Bagels, has opened up a place on the Lower East Side, okay, uh, so of New York. And I'm going, wait, what? And of course, if you do a quick search, it's like, well, it's actually the Morena family that owns the place. <laughs> so, they, and no, they would not open a Montreal bagel place in, Mon in New York. So it's really interesting. Like the alpaca just literally had generated, hallucinated an entire answer based on people that didn't exist and a location that didn't exist, but with a real Montreal bagel place. So yeah, pretty freaky. It, yeah. And we've also read about examples where LMs can even predict the future. If, uh, yeah, like maybe where is the next World Cup going to be held or when is the world going to be ending, then you'll probably will read about some interesting answers generated by this LLMs too. I did that. I asked who was the next person that would be fired from Databricks. And the next person to be fired from Databricks is the head of engineering. No factual source can be cited from any of that. <laughs> I hope a node keeps his job. Uh, but that is just another example of a hallucination that cannot be verified from the source at all. Uh, okay, so now I think that actually segues to the next way. What are things we could do to mitigate the risks of these hallucinations? that case that is a very loaded question and <laughs> so when it comes to maybe talk, let's talk about the immediate mitigation risk that we can use as fellow developers you know we the, the, the first the first thing that we can do is to tone down the temperature uh, of an LLM so temperature means is this a parameter that helps us to balance between like what the model has learned versus generating some new content so if we turn down the temperature to be a lower number then it tends to stick to what it knows uh, so that can reduce this type of generated text that is completely nonsensical but on the on the other hand uh, I think Sam can also talk a bit about this a bit more as well it's about chain of thought you know prompting how do we guide the LOMs in prompts to make sure that LOMs uh, can be can arrive at a more accurate answer without going off the train. Um, so those are the two common things that developers can do. But of course, there's always going to be research community involved. Like maybe we can come up with better model architectures and we can also supply it with better data uh, to help model to reduce hallucination as well. Uh, so I, you know, I think it's also maybe useful just to go back to what an LLM is fundamentally. It, it's really just a model that produces a probability distribution and it picks what it thinks is the next best word. That, that's really all it does. It just, it just produces a probability you know, graph or whatever and picks, if your temperature is set to zero, it basically just picks what it thinks is the highest. If you set a very high temperature value, it kind of takes a random shot at uh, the next word or the next token. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, trying to improve hallucination and, and tying these things back to reality, one thing that there's a number of different ways to do this. There's some offline evaluation, there's some online evaluation and some different tools that we could talk about for that. Uh, some have found putting all of the information you need in the prompt itself. So we're getting very large context windows these days. Uh, OpenAI just released 16K for their uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo yesterday. And so what you can do is put all the information you want it to look at in the prompt and then just ask it only refer to the prompt and uh, they can be 
trained or uh, most of the models are pretty good at adhering to that kind of instruction. Uh, but with the, with the chain of thought process, that's a, a huge area of research where you're sort of using a large language model, not we're not using the, the knowledge or the sort of database. You can think of an LLM as a kind of database in some ways, but we're not using any of that. We're using it more as a reasoning engine. And so you, uh, you ask it to sort of print out all of its steps as you ask it you know, to solve this particular problem or respond to this particular question. Tell me exactly how you're going about this. And what it tends to do is to say, well, first, I don't understand this part. Let me go figure out that and so on and so on. And so it breaks down the, the problem into sort of bite-sized chunks where you can see what the LLM is doing. And this is really helpful for things like mitigating problems when it uh, perhaps goes in the wrong direction, you need to nudge it back. Uh, and it also has enabled us to connect large language models uh, with something that we might talk about before the end of this uh, call, which is you know the future of LLMs with plugins and all these other things. Uh, but the train of thought process really helps to demystify what's going on with an LLM when it comes back with an answer. Yeah, and tying it all back to maybe the first question about vector databases, this is also one of the appeals of vector databases. As Joseph implied earlier, we supply documents or maybe even provide documents to an LLM to hopefully return us more relevant documents and generate us some very domain-specific uh, generation of text. Uh, so when it comes to hallucination, then we can also think about vector databases as this source of truth, uh, as, as this ability to provide this factual recall to LLMs so that it can also help the large language models to generate more factually correct responses. Awesome. And so we've talked a lot about vector databases, prompt engineering, but let's actually talk about choosing an LLM. And so what are some of the criteria that you would use when you evaluate whether to go for an open source versus proprietary model? Perhaps I'll start with you, Joseph. Sure. I, I guess I take a practical approach where, you know, there are certainly a whole range of very large, powerful models, which are meant, meant to be super general, and a lot of uh, ones which have been fine-tuned for specific use cases um, or can be fine-tuned for your specific data and use case. And so, you know, think about, you, you may choose to do something initially in prototyping, which will be different from what you do eventually if you decide it's a real thing you want to move to production. Um, and I think it's very reasonable to start with a general model, not specific to your use case, uh, maybe one which is more expensive to query, a paid API or something, and uh, use that to prove that this is possible. It can be useful for your customers or your you personally. And then, you know, in time, you can either lower the cost or improve performance by maybe taking an open model, fine tuning it for your data as you collect more data um, and iterating from there. I think both are good possibilities and um, like planning for that continuum from going from like a paid source, like collecting data along the way so that you have the options in the future uh, is really valuable. That's excellent advice. Uh, do you have any advice on best practices for fine tuning? Uh, Sam, do you want to cover that one? <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, also, while we're here, quick shout out to the course uh, that we all made. Uh, we go through a couple of examples of picking the right model for you, uh, both, say, from Hugging Face, but also if you have a scenario, whether or not you want to go from a paid version to more of an open source version and then to fine tuning if you need to, which is becoming more and more of a last resort, really. It used to be the only way if you make something useful from like the early BERT days was to trade to fine tune it. Otherwise you've just got something that doesn't really do anything helpful. Uh, but these days, the even the foundation models are so large and so capable that they can often do quite a lot with things like few shot learning, where you show it some examples of what you want it to do and then ask me a question, or even zero shot learning where you just ask it to do something and uh, it somehow figures it out in the billions of parameters that it has to work with. But in terms of, you know, what, when you get to a certain point, sometimes you think, it's just not good enough, I need to fine tune this. The field has really developed and become very rich with more than just the, I have a data set, I have a model that's been trained up to a certain point, so let's keep going. We've seen a huge amount of advances, mostly in optimization to take large models and update them in a resource efficient way. So things like, like LoRa and, and some of the other uh, interesting applications, even Dolly, uh, just a quick shout out to Dolly, where you take a model that's maybe, maybe past its prime 
and infuse it with high quality data and then you really can end up with something quite valuable. But in terms of you know, technical things for fine tuning, there's a bunch of new libraries come out uh, that have been embraced by the open source community. So like Deep Speed, which helps you run on multiple GPU and TPU clusters and uh, all of these kinds of things. Hugging Face has done uh, really a great job in bolstering the community and, and continually pushing out more and more uh, tools and resources. You know, they had their Accelerate library. Uh, they just partnered with uh, AMD. I think yesterday they announced it, uh, this huge thing for tighter integration with their hardware. Uh, and so for, for fine tuning, you really want to, like Joseph said, start broad in general, which would probably cover about 80% of use cases. And then after that, there is a bit of a, a jungle out there in terms of what you can do. Um, but the good thing is that there is lots that you can do. Uh, it does take investment for sure. So it's uh, not for the faint of heart at this point. Perfect. Well, this is, I'm going to segue because we're actually uh, having this wonderful conversation, but we also have to not allow this session to become an hour and a half. <laughs> so, uh, so let me segue to a, complete, a slightly different question, but one that also each of you actually has your own perspective on, which is what are the top LM use cases that you're currently seeing in the field, right? Uh, let's start with that because there's also a flip question I want to ask right afterwards, but yeah, let's just start with that. Like what are the top LM use cases that you're currently seeing? Currently, we definitely are seeing a lot of chat-based applications, uh, maybe also because of the rise uh, and also uh, the, the rise of autoregressive models like ChatGPT, where we can see that it really does mimic the human interactions very well. So I would say that currently, we're definitely seeing sort of an avalanche of chat-based applications uh, in the field right now. I think I'd also add to that, I mean, given the mention of uh, vector databases earlier, like every company has a bunch of internal valuable documents and, you know, they have some search over it right now, but uh, providing more interactive ways to uh, work with those and do just like even basic Q&A, not necessarily chat. I mean, chat often comes as like the second step after basic Q&A. Um, it's like one of the top things. Yeah, I'd say the other thing that we see a lot of is UI interaction is just changing entirely. You know, you see it with the Adobe suite, you know, you just tell it that you want to put this here or that there, and it sort of just translates it. Uh, you know, that that's sort of combining large language models with, uh, with other image-based stuff, which also share a lot of similar components. But um, I think the, the way we're going to see adapting large language models to user and UI and UX, I think is going to be a huge thing too. Cool. Well then, uh, let me flip it now. Like which, which, uh, where are use cases or scenarios where you're not seeing LMs replace traditional ML? In other words, traditional ML is still very comfortably <laughs> going to be take, tackling these use cases as opposed to LMs replacing them anytime soon. I would prefer that like the easy answer is applications where there are regulatory requirements requiring some kind of explainability. Like what exactly is this model doing? How is it biased, et cetera? Like people are starting to chip away at like things around that with LLMs, partly from the research side in terms of attempting to explain what these Boolean parameter models are doing and partly from the regulatory side of trying to define some kind of meaningful requirements around like, you know, what you can do with LLMs without completely restricting their use. Um, so I'm, that's kind of the most obvious, I think, area where traditional ML will be important for a long time. Yeah, and I will also maybe extend the question one step further by asking where do we see LMs not replacing humans? You know, when, when we talk about like this, like chat-based applications, we think about them improving, say, customer service or even some really very professional occupations, you know, things like occupations like lawyers, for example. But we have also seen examples of LLMs hallucinating cases that have never existed before, uh, but as a very confident lawyer, you know. So, so I think those, 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 there will still be scenarios where we definitely need human in the loop, just like traditional ML. Uh, I can also think about examples where customer service chatbot in the financial industry, uh, we probably won't be entirely confident in giving financial advice or giving legal advice with just entirely all empowered without any human uh, oversight at all. So, so I think we 
there, there still needs to be cooperation between the both. Yeah, and I think I think finally the last thing that we won't see large language models replace for a while is really analytical things. So when we have regression models to calculate, you know, numerical values based on numerical data, I think large language models probably interact with models that are built and trained on those things. But just in terms of efficiency, training a regression model that's just for number generation or number calculating, uh, I don't think that's a valuable use of an LLM's uh, cost. Yeah, I've also seen a lot of Dataverse customers ask about using LLMs for code migration. Um, they have these 20 year old legacy systems. Nobody's been around at the company for that long to understand how it was built, what it's doing. Is any of this code actually still useful? And so I've seen a lot of customers trying to experiment with using LLMs to help with code migrations, which leads me to my next question for you all. What are some of the biggest challenges you all see with uh, companies or customers trying to adopt large language models? That's a hard question. <laughs> I, where do we see customers wrestling the most with LMs? I, I think I, I think the hardest thing so far is is just that there is a lot of noise and there is a lot of still ongoing development in the field right now, and it can be really hard to see through, like to identify what is actually the most important thing. Like for example, when we talk about vector databases, do we actually need vector databases? But we can also even take a step back and say, well, I have been using NLP for a long time. Do I necessarily now need to pivot to using this uh, quote unquote, you know, large language models when we have also been using language models for a really long time as well. So, so I think part of the challenge that the field has to figure out or the business leaders have to figure out is, well, if I have an existing NLP application, how do I make it you know, continually relevant? Or does this necessarily mean that I need to pivot to using something that is much more you know, hype worthy? Uh, so, so I think it will also take some wisdom from, from the leader, leadership side you know, to really put on their foot and say, well, I, I think we are in a good place. We, we don't have to worry that we'll be sort of be flooded you know, or, or be uh, outdated if we are not upgrading to this like newer applications. Um, so I think that's probably the hardest first decision that any leaders will have to make at, at, at this stage. Yeah, I think that's, that's good. I also think that there's this notion that LLMs are geniuses at everything. And they're, they're honestly, like, unless you, unless you go for the biggest models today, anyway, they're, they're not that good at a lot of things. They're, they're, they're pretty good at some things and they can do things that most other models can't do, but that doesn't mean that they're very good at it. Uh, like traditional NLP problems, sure, they, they do that really well. But I think there's this, this mystery and this intrigue that they can do supernatural things or super intellectual things, which they, they really can't. Uh, you know, some can do some really impressive things, but they're not a panacea. They can't solve all the problems. And I think there's a, uh, the hype has sort of betrayed people in some way that, you know, they're not all it's cracked up to be. Like, we're probably heading to like the, you know, the Gartner curve trough of disillusionment pretty quickly. So I think that's something as well that needs to be communicated better, I think, to, to the broader industries out there. I guess I'll just add, I feel like one of the big differences from traditional ML, which these companies are hitting is um, LLMs are quick to get started with. You know, you can just send a text query against an existing API and get an answer back and say, wow, you know, my application is possible. Um, I have a prototype here. And so I think that's kind of true, but I think that then people much faster, like early on in these projects, hit operational questions, which would in traditional ML happen after they had been working with data for, you know, weeks or months, um, depending on the size and challenge of their problem. Um, and so you have people, I think, who, you know, maybe data scientists or even not with a data science background in the business, like finding these applications, they want to get to production. Um, but then hitting questions like, oh, well, now we need to get, you know, collect human feedback. Now we need to uh, figure out how we're evaluating our model. Now we need to uh, not just use this expensive API, but like lower cost with our own fine tuned model. And they're hitting these operations questions like a lot earlier on in projects. Yeah, and what Joseph reminded me of is also that the, the data quality is, problem is still there. You know, it's uh, with LMs, I think we are probably made more aware of the, of the data quality problems underneath because we are much more easily, you know, able to identify, oh, this doesn't sound right or, or, or that doesn't sound 
possible. So in, in a way, I think LMs have definitely, like like what Sam said, uh, democ democratize how humans can interact with this machine learning models in a way that we haven't been able to do before. But it also highlights the issue that we probably have been neglecting for a while, which is how we how we confirm that the data is good and how do we co make corrections or audit those data if they are not good. And I think we will have to con continue to wrestle with that data quality problem as we move forward. It always comes back to the data. Exactly, which is why it's called data brew, right? <laughs> ha, thank you, Chengen, for the plugin. <laughs> nice plugin, I like that, yes. Not a vector, but. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have to start calling this vector brew, which I don't want to do. <laughs> so last question for all of you. This field is changing so quickly. How do you even attempt to stay up to date in this field? Uh, I'd say there is a constant outpouring of media and emails and, you know, um, chat messages. So, I mean, sure, scanning those actually gives like a, a quick rundown. I think the step I have not taken yet is automatically funneling, funneling all of those through an LLM to give me a summary. Uh, I'll have to do that at some point. <laughs> uh, but no, seriously, I mean, I think there's a lot of activity, which, and so like, it is hard to keep up, but I think that the most valuable things have been actually taking the time to do like one real task, like actually write an LLM pipeline to do, you know, even simple document Q&A and like, a hands-on desk like that just gives you so much better of an intuition than like reading all these marketing emails and articles. Yeah, I have to say it's it's certainly a um, a task. It's, I, I saw someone on Twitter referring to to this as a full time job to keep up on everything that's going on. It's it's very true. I will say, you know, other compared to other technical hypes that have happened maybe in the last uh, ten years. I think because this field is not, you know, no one's out to create a quick buck or a scam sort of thing with maybe other technical advances that have happened in the last 10, 20 years. The, like a huge shout out to the community behind this because just everyone is really excited about all these different things and people are writing so many articles or at least they're getting articles written by uh, some agent. Uh, but like, there's just so much content out there and it's it's actually probably, this has been one of the easiest hypes to, just get information on because everyone's writing and releasing and producing content for it. And so for me, it's, it's really just following, you know, medium articles, YouTube, Twitter, all these things where people are putting copious amounts of information all the time. It's, it's less about trying to find the data and just not getting overwhelmed with it. And I think everyone is, I think the fatigue, the LLM fatigue set, you know, really, really came and saturated the market about a month ago. Uh, and so everyone's just sort of trying to keep up as best they can now. Yeah, and I will also say that it's okay not to know every single thing that is happening right now. And it also is perfectly sensical to just pick a topic of interest and just go dive deep, you know, rather than trying to be a generalist. Uh, so, so I, the, you know, the, the tips are probably applicable to just in general computer science as well. Like if you ask somebody, how do you keep up with the development of computer science, probably most likely the answer will be, yeah, it's impossible. So, so I, I think we can probably also extend that idea over here as well. You know, give, give yourself some grace and then pick your topic of interest and then go from there. Super helpful advice. Uh, if any of you want to dive deeper into these topics, I highly recommend that you check out the Large Language Models Application Through Production course on edX and Databricks Academy, and as well on YouTube, uh, if you're interested in learning more about these topics from Joseph, Sam, and Shangin. So thank you all again for joining us today on Databrew. Awesome. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, bro. Have a good day. Thank you.